we ready? Okay. I'd like to call the 38th meeting of the 23rd Council to order. Uh, roll call. I believe all councillors are present, are present um, and Councillor Pena will be joining us via telephone. And um, I would like to ask um, Councillor Sanchez if you would do the Pledge of Allegiance. We start with a moment of silence. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. And I would just like to, in that uh, moment of silence, um, remember the uh, municipal workers in Virginia and uh, just acknowledge that uh, we are supportive of their city and their state. Um, okay, so with that, <coughs> Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the sign-up table. The council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening if needed. We want tonight's proceedings to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please do not make any personal attacks and no applause or other outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we are respectful of one another. To that end, I want to say a few words about decorum and the rules that have been put in place. I believe that everyone has received a handout of the rules, and if they are available, but there are no signs, props, posters, or banners allowed in the chambers to be displayed. Items displayed on the overhead projector must be removed from the projector at the end of the person's public com comment. Only the in individual whom the council president has called on to provide public comment may stand at the podium. The two minute time limit for public comment will be strictly enforced and com comments should be directed through the council president. There will be no tolerance for disruptive public outbursts. The handicapped landing area to the right side of the dais must be kept clear at all times. And the fire marshal will strictly enforce the ingress and egress rules so as to ensure public safety. I will pro provide a one minute warning to any disruption upon the second or continued disruption that individual may be asked to leave the chambers. And we, we have our security in place. So with that, um, I would go to item number three. And this is a um, proclamation and presentations. And I think, I'm not sure who's presenting this. Is it me? I don't, is it Council Benton? Friends of Public Art? Yes, uh, Madam Vice President, uh, Ms. Erin Elder is here to make a presentation oh, to the Council on the Friends of Public Art program. Um, good evening. Would you identify yourself and who you represent, please? Yes. Um, my name is Erin Elder, and I'm the president of a new organization called the Friends of Public Art. And we were formed in 2016 to celebrate, augment, and contextualize public art in our city. And I'm here today to present each of you with a complimentary copy of our recent publication. It's called Visually Speaking, A Companion to Public Art in Albuquerque. And it's a collection of short essays that um, give a brief history to our city's public art program, along with unknown stories about famous and lesser known public artworks. And the book celebrates not only art funded by our city's 1% uh, for art program, but also community-generated and DIY public art. Um, it's extraordinary to live in this city that has supported public art for 40 years. And um, so we're really grateful to you and to this legislative body for continuing to do that. So um, please accept this gift uh, to you. And um, we look forward to celebrating more public art in our city. So, thank you thank so you. much. 
Thank you. And I didn't see the mayor up there. I was wondering, um, but the mayor is here this evening, so I'm going to change the agenda just a tad. Um, mayor, would you like to come down? I believe that he is here to sign our budget, and we're happy to have you, Mayor. All right, well, good evening, Council. Um, thank you for allowing me a little bit of time actually to just celebrate together. Um, what I thought I would do is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take care of this legislation as one. Uh, I actually think we didn't really do a long historical search, but I don't think a mayor has ever come down and signed a budget with council. So <laughs> we might as well do that and celebrate being together on this one. And I thought just quickly for the public, I'll, I'll share a few kind of hidden nuggets in there, which all of you know about, but I think might just be good for the public to be aware of too. Uh, but let me, I think, begin just by saying thank you. I appreciate all the hard work, especially uh, with our uh, Committee of the Whole Chair, uh, as well as our council president and each councilor for the work that you put in on this, and also for being able to get it done, of course, uh, on time and on budget and balanced, uh, something that I very much appreciate. And I know many of you have known me, so, some of you have known me before I got this job, some of you were still getting to know each other, but uh, I think this is really just a great example of uh, one Albuquerque, of coming together to agree that we've got to accelerate the pace of change. We might have to do a few things differently than we've done in the past. And I kind of wanted to reflect that by coming down here and signing it with you, uh, this budget as well. Now, of course, as everyone on council knows, this includes funding for our bike officer program uh, that council developed. It also includes 100 new police officers. Um, and that actually is the next batch because we're going to see another batch of 20 hit the streets in July. <clears throat> and that we are on target to meet our obligation of the first 100 that we talked about last year. <laughs> and so we'll be presenting you with kind of accurate figures probably I don't know because of the break where it'll come, but the good news is we're on target for that first 100, and now we have the funding for the second 100. And so that is a tremendous thing. And also just want to remind folks, when we say officers, uh, it's all folks who are engaged in that meeting. It's also detectives. It's specialists. Sometimes it's our coast folks who work with homeless individuals. Uh, it's everyone in law enforcement uh, who deals with all the specialties within that department. Of course, we also invested in ramping up our after school and summer programs. Thank you again for that. We are going to be able to once again add several thousands of children into programs this summer and throughout the school year for that. And also launch our increment of one program. I appreciate that. Of course, everyone knows this is the state JTIP program. Uh, going to be establishing that for the city and hopefully it'll be a big success and we'll ask for more funding next year. Uh, but we will test that out uh, together with you over the following year. And uh, of course, I also want to acknowledge we learned a little bit, we always do, and we even, I think, heard some of the mistakes and challenges we might have had in the first uh, fees uh, proposal for AFR. You know, I think that was a little broader than maybe all of us initially thought, and I just want to compliment the council uh, and our staff for coming together and narrowing that and making, I think, making it what it was always supposed to be, which is for, you know, these sort of egregious situations. And so I want to just acknowledge uh, listening and learning and hopefully moving fast to correct something that, you know, was a little broader than I think any of us had intended. And so with that, let me mention a couple of smaller nuggets. You know, two new positions in innovation and performance. I think those are going to pay for themselves. I'm sure many of you will be interested to see the reports they write. Uh, a broadly enhanced spay and neuter program for low-income communities. Uh, a LIDA program for our aviation department, which we know with that business park, very important. The Jim Henson exhibit coming to cultural services. Uh, these are just some of the many small things that are really going to make a big difference. And some of the less glamorous things like self-insurance. I think this is going to save us $5 million over the long term. Uh, we're using drones now. We can fund drones to do building inspections. Believe it or not, that's actually a big deal for staff and for efficiency. And so there are many small things hidden inside this budget that are also going to make di big differences, even uh, finally funding our South Valley Respite Center. And so I want to thank you for including each one of those two. So this, with our geo bond program, I think does set us 
we've taken the critical steps to, I think, laying a foundation to really move up as a city and lift our city up in many ways where it had been struggling uh, for the past decade. These were long-standing challenges that will take a long time to fix. But I think we made a clear statement in the GO bond and in the budget that we are going to address these programs head on and we are going to invest in them and we're going to hold ourselves accountable for actually making sure those dollars make a difference. And so thank you so much for that. And um, with that, if I can remember what date today is, the fourth? Third? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Thank you, public comment. <laughs> it's a good thing we got that. So I'll go ahead and sign this here today, approved on the 3rd of June. And sign this over and hand it right to our clerk. Is she here? I believe she is, Mayor. All right, Katie, let's come finish it right here. Thank you so much, Council. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all the hard work. And thank you, citizens of Albuquerque, for all your input in this process. Thank you, Mayor. Any councilors would like to say anything to Councilor Sanchez? Mayor Keller, uh, thank you for coming down and signing the budget. That is the first time that I've been in office that I've seen the mayor come down to sign the budget. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, this is the first time ever that we've gone over a billion dollars uh, for our general fund budget and enterprise fund budget. And it took a tremendous amount of work. I want to thank you. I want to thank your staff and your team for the work they've done. I want to thank the Committee of, committee of the Whole Chairman, uh, our uh, Councilor, Councilor Jones, for doing a great job, and Stephanie Aro and, and our team in working in collaboration with your team. Because, I mean, that's how things get done, is people working together. And it was a difficult budget, and the number one priority still remained public safety. And I'm very pleased to see that, that we are increasing our department by 100 officers a year. That was your goal when you were running for office. That's been our goal for a long time, and we are attaining those numbers, and I think it's critical to the public that we continue to assure them that we are increasing those numbers till we get to 1,200 police officers. Thank you. Councillor Benton and then Councillor Davis. Thank you also, Mayor, for, for coming down. I just want to give a shout out to our Chief Financial Officer, Sanjay Bhakta. Uh, you know, he, he really kind of set us on the path to what we did this year with the operating budget. And uh, I know he's had some difficult times and our hearts go out to him. And, uh, but I wanted to, to uh, acknowledge him as well. Councilor Davis. Well, you beat me to it, so I think that's great. Thanks for covering that, Councilor. Uh, and Mayor, I gotta say, I think it's great. If for folks watching at home or looking, a lot, uh, looking around, um, I hope this is a message that they take that seeing the mayor come down and do this and work with the city council, um, we do this a lot more often than we used to, and I think folks don't see that very much. Uh, but for folks that have watched city politics for a long time, I think they should be excited to see that the mayor and the city council are on the same page when it comes to public safety, job creation, uh, innovations for our city. Um, and I think it's a great message to see us all working together on this. So thanks for coming down to share that. It's a really important message that the public gets to see when we do things work together and uh, can actually get things done by working together. So thank you and to your staff and your team for helping us do that. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I'm going to go a little different road. I would like to thank our council services, all of the people on council, all of our policy analysts, uh, Director uh, Stephanie Yara, who has pulled down double duty and more and almost all nighters for a few nights while we were putting this thing together and making it work. So uh, it was a joint project. Uh, every one of us worked hard and made compromises, uh, and we appreciate your signing it, sir. Mayor, I'd like to say thank you and uh, for, you know, working with you and working with Councillor Jones and Councillor Pena and all the other councillors and realizing that we all were very um, excited to propose our projects, but when we did have to, in the end, sort of dwindle things down and really compromise, it was a really good uh, effort. And, uh, and I thank all of us for working together. Our staff was amazing, and uh, they definitely had a hand in, or maybe they led us, I don't know, but um, definitely we, we should be appreciative of them. So thank you for being here today. Wonderful. Councilor Harris. Uh, just very quickly, uh, thank you, Mayor, for coming down, and, and just one observation that on this dais you don't see an aisle. Um, and I think that's one thing that's unique about municipal government. It's nonpartisan, and I think we get a lot more done in, in other uh, branches of government, both federal and state. So um, I appreciate this aisle-less uh, body that we have, and, uh, and thank you, Mayor, for, for working with us. 
Well, thank you very much, Council. And, um, you know, let me also, I'm glad everyone appreciated the staff on both sides. I know the great news is our staff works together a lot and they work very, very hard. And, uh, you know, I, I am a firm believer that 99% of the credit belongs to them. And I know I appreciate your kind words about uh, Sanjay, too, of course, just given his situation and also his absence. But he'll be back in July. Uh, and also, uh, Sarita's just out of town, so she also expresses her gratitude and, of course, the team up here. Thank you so much, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next item is item number four, economic development discussion, and I don't believe there's any this evening. Um, so we will go on to item number five, which is administration question and answer period. Councilors, do you have any questions of the administration? Councilor Davis, do you have your hand up? No. Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. I have a question for staff for the chief, if he is here. And this is in regards to the uh, Department of Justice and the settlement agreement. I know that uh, Judge Brack has left and he's been replaced. Has there been any hearings or meetings with the new federal judge that's serving on this case? Uh, <coughs> Vice President Borrego, Councilor Sanchez, I'm happy to, to answer that uh, question on behalf of the department. Um, no, at this point, we have not had any public hearings. Uh, and so we are currently working with all of the parties in the case uh, to try to get some clarification from the court on when we can expect that next uh, public presentation to be. Because we, we continue to pay uh, the federal monitor, uh, Dr. Ginger, over a million dollars a year. And I would hope that we would have a federal judge start looking at these, this case and getting some of these issues resolved. And it really troubles me that the taxpayers are still paying that bill on an annual basis. And I would hope that we would have some clarification on when there will be a hearing. Uh, Vice President Borrego, Councilor Sanchez, uh, we are asking for that same clarification as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, we will move on to item number six, which is the journal. I move approval of the May 29th journal. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Being none, all in favor say, say yes, please. Yes. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Oh, Councilor Pena, you are on the phone. Thank you. Um, so we will move on to communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? If not, well, I guess there are a couple. Um, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC 415 on tonight's agenda for final action. EC 4 415 is an agreement with the Honorable Nan Nash to provide services as a hearing officer. And we need a two-thirds majority of uh, our counselors on this. So um, all in favor? Second, thank you. There's a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Okay, being none, then I um, ask that everyone signify by saying yes. 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 Any, op any opposed? Councilor Pena, was that a yes? Yes. Thank you. Okay, is that a two-thirds two majority? Thank you. Okay, uh, yes, Councilor Benton. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'm gonna try this again. Um, I move to pull 01954 from the Finance and Government Operations Committee and place it on the agenda for June 17th for uh, final action. And Councilors, uh, at the last meeting, uh, we did pull uh, Councilor Harris's bill on this same subject, P193. Uh, I that occurred, and I actually supported pulling that because I thought we were going to discuss both bills at the same time. I think it's appropriate uh, that we discuss both of these bills at the same time. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm asking again that, that we, uh, we will be hearing Councilor uh, Harris's bill for the first hearing tonight. It requires two hearing. Um, this uh, would also require two hearing? Or no, because it, it would be a, an enactment. Uh, however, the intention would be to discuss both of these bills and both of these methods to, uh, to uh, consider ranked choice voting. So uh, I, I move to pull 01954. Okay. Um, there's a motion and a second. Councilor Sanchez has a comment. Uh, thank you, Ma Madam Vice President. I would like to move that we table this until we have uh, Councilor Harris back in the room. 
Well, Councillor Harris is not here. I'm, you know, he's uh, right there. Okay. Uh, we'll give Councillor Harris a minute to get down here. Um, in the meantime, Councillor Benton, would you explain exactly what O1954 is? Councillor Benton. Madam Vice President, I can do that if that's. Councillor Davis. Uh, Madam Vice President, uh, the ordinance that the Councillor was trying to pull, uh, I was proposing to pull, would enact ranked choice voting in the, for the November election that's upcoming, um, as opposed to other alternatives that might ask voters to place it on the ballot uh, for approval for a future election. Um, if, if I may, uh, Madam Vice President, if I could just comment on the, the motion on the floor. Uh, I think this is a good idea for those purposes of those discussion. Essentially, we have a couple of options for ranked choice voting. Uh, either way, it looks like we'll end up on the, at our next meeting uh, with opportunity for final action for this council to make that decision. And there are some different proposals of how to do that. And I think it's important that we have all those before us. Um, the council may vote for one or the other or none. Um, but I think it's, uh, it makes sense for us to have all those options so that we can have a real debate on the most appropriate uh, piece for that and also to allow the administration and the public um, to design their comments uh, around all those options. And so I would encourage uh, other counselors to support, at least for the purpose of discussion, by support this, uh, the motion by Councilor Ben. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with Councilor Davis. I believe that this is something that we need to talk about both of these issues at the same time. Uh, see what we like and what's going forward as much as I don't like the idea of it. I think that we need to discuss both instead of trying to vote on one and defer another and not vote on that one and let's, let's get it all out in the open so I will support moving it to tonight's meeting. Councilor Harris. Sure, I just, uh, I, I don't agree with uh, taking this decision away from the voters. If we're gonna empower voters, we should empower them to decide how they vote. So I won't be supporting this. And this is, a, the motion is to bring it for the 17th meeting. Is that at the motion? Councilor Benton. To, to clarify. Councilor Harris, since you weren't in the room, yes, it would be to hear it on the 17th. And this would not be to take anything away from the voters. Your bill is out there before the council. This is for the council to discuss the two paths, if we choose to go this, to, towards this at all. But these two paths be heard together. Any other discussion? If not, we have a motion and a second to um, change the letter of introduction and include O1954 uh, and include it in the uh, June 17th hearing. All in favor, signify by saying yes. 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 No? No. No. Councilor Pena? She's on the line, I believe. Councilor Pena? Yes, no. <laughs> so is that a no vote, Councilor Pena? <laughs> yes, that was a no vote. Okay, so five to four. Okay, so that motion passes on a five to four vote. And Councilor Sanchez? Does that require five votes or does it require the six votes? Yes, Madam uh, Vice President, it was just to pull it out of the FGO agenda and move it to the June 17th meeting, so it only requires five votes. If it were going to be placed for immediate action tonight, it would require the supermajority. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move on on our agenda, and we added that one additional item. Um, Councilor Harris and Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing R-163 and referring it to the Finance and Government Operations Committee. R-163 is amending the adopted capital implementation program of the City of Albuquerque by approving new projects, supplementing current appropriations, and changing the scope of existing projects. I move it to pass. And this does require a two-thirds um, vote, and I'll second that. So, um, any discussion? Be none, all in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposed? No. Councilor Pena? It's a yes, and I apologize. There's a little bit of a delay. 
Oh, there's a slight delay. Okay. So that passes unanimously. Okay, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing 067 and referring it to the Finance and Government Operations Committee. Thank you. Okay, um, there's a motion. Is there a second? second? There's a motion and a second. And this is for amending Chapter 2, Article 4, to add the limitations on seed money and maintenance of campaign in off years ordinances. And this requires a two thirds vote. Correct? Correct. Okay, Correct. any discussion? Okay, a uh, motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Okay, that, re that passes unanimously. Okay, Councillor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing Article 164 and referring it to the Finance and Government Operations Committee. And do you want to say what it is? R164 is concerning a bond election to be held in the city of Albuquerque at the next regular local election on November the 5th of 2019. Submitting to the, pretty much there it is. Okay. All right, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All, any discussion? If not, all in favor, say yes. 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 Any opposed? Councillor Pena, did you vote? Councillor Pena? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I forget there is a slight delay. <laughs> okay. Um, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing 165 and referring it to the Finance and Government Operation Committee. Our 165 is adopting propositions to be submitted to the voters at the next local election to be held in the city of Albuquerque concerning questions amending Article 2, Section 2 and 3, Article 4, Sections 4, Article 5, Sections 2, Article 8, Sections 14 and 16, Sections 3, 4, 8, 12, 15, 20 and 21 of the Albuquerque City Charter and adding Section 22 to Article 16, providing uh, the form of the questions and the designation clause for such questions on the ballot. And this also requires a two-thirds vote. I'll second that, Councillor Sanchez. Um, any discussion, Councillors? Being none, all in favor, say, say yes. 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 Any opposed? Yes. That passes unanimously. Okay, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you. One more. Uh, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing R66 and referring it to the Finance and Government Operations Committee. R166 is concerning the local elections to be held in the City of Albuquerque on November the 5th of 2019. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Being none, Councillors, signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposed? Yes. And I believe Councillor, San Councillor Pena said yes. So that passes also. So I move approval of the letter of introduction. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Being none, all in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposed? No. Yes. Okay, there's not any opposed. I, I, I wasn't opposing that, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will move on to item number eight, which is reports of committees. And there are none. So, um, counselors, are there any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Okay, we'll move on. So, we will move on to item number nine, which is the consent agenda, and there are none. Um, so, we will go on to public comments. And again, there is a two minute time limit. The light on the podium will be green for the first minute and a half, and then the light will turn yellow and the bell will ring, indicating you have 30 seconds remaining to wrap up your comments. At two minutes, the light will turn red and ring to indicate your time is up. And we have about 23 people signed up to speak tonight. Uh, and we will start with Mr. Don Schwerter, Schrader. And then we will move on to Laura Dale. So if you'd like to come forward, and Downey X. Eight years ago, last Friday, 
my longtime dear friend Daniel from Martinez Town told me he wanted sex with me for the first time, but not a relationship. He said, if I told anyone, he would kill me and maybe kill himself. I did not have sex with him. I want to celebrate sex with a friend, not hide it as a poison secret to keep him from killing me and himself. As he left my home that day, he told me, I love you, maybe the only time since I met him 39 years before. The next day, he was dead from a violent street attack. I was devastated. I deeply loved him. Until any man on earth who enjoys sex and romance with men can tell his family and friends with no shame, no fear, no guilt. And until any woman on earth who enjoys sex and romance with women can tell her family and friends with no shame, no fear, no guilt. Our struggle for romantic freedom must continue. Why watch and cheer boxing and football, men bruising and brain injuring men? Why praise men killing men in war? Why shame men enjoying affectionate, passionate sex with men? Why shame men in love and making love with men? Thank you, Mr. Schrader. Lara Laura Dale, and then Downey X and John Paul Jones. President and council members, I'm sure it's no surprise what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I just have a, a, a sort of a plea or a question to the council. Um, I understand, I, I'm curious about the status of the, re the recommendation of award for public access. From what I've been able to find out, procurement admitted you public GCMA as the sole bidder. There was a judging committee. I've seen the documents. They've already judged it and voted for you public because they were the sole bidder. Um, the council, to my knowledge, I've, I've called several different assistants and they said they haven't received it from the mayor's <coughs> office. I talked to the mayor out in the hallway he said they're looking into it. I got Isaac Padilla's card. My frustration is you have one more meeting. I thought we would have this voted one way or another before the break. You have cable subscribers right now, some of you might be them, who are paying for this service. You haven't received it in full for seven years. Now we've got another three months drag out to even figure out what's going on with it to give the public the service that all of us subscribers are paying for and have not received. So I'm just asking on behalf of the cable subscribers, what is going on with the ROA? If it's in the mayor's office and it just got overlooked or something, can somebody who cares about this please look into it? I know it's probably an impossible thing. I would love to see the vote happen at the next meeting. It's probably not, but that means another three months that your cable subscribers who are paying for this service, this doesn't come from the city. They are paying for it and they're not getting it. Thank you, ma'am. Councilor Benson. Um, I, I just wanted to ask about, because uh, I think you've advocated in the past for quote unquote, which I... You know, honestly, Isaac, I don't care. You the, don't honestly, care? I well, just want I mean, somebody who will get the public we, programming. We heard out. ad infinitum about quote unquote, and I happen to agree that that, that would have been our best choice. But quote unquote, failed to enter just the basic paperwork that was required to be considered and to compete against the other entity. Well, so, I, I, I mean, I, I, for, I, for you to come down and say, well, we're dragging it out, you know, <laughs> here was the big opportunity, right? And it wasn't even... It, and there was a... The there was apparently a, what didn't I have felt, their act Honestly, together. there was what I felt was a legitimate contest of what procurement determined as a submission. Um, and there's still a feeling amongst the community that that wasn't a fair assessment. And it wasn't just from quote unquote, all three other bidders had the same complaints. So there was a feeling again that there's a little bit of an issue with procurement, but that's your, your take versus mine. Well, um, if I could yeah. respond to that, um, there's a process for 
for challenging decisions that are made on procurement. And we so, did. So quote unquote, you know, I mean, maybe we need a, a complete rundown when we do hear this from the administration about what what uh, challenges were made, what, what uh, uh, protests were made. But, um, you know, we're in a difficult position. We're not, you know, the council doesn't operate the procurement process. We're the final yeah. signatory on it. Yeah. We listen to the public and we, I personally have, do care about what I've heard over the years and have been disappointed in, in the product that we've had over the past seven years. So Isaac, um, just one question I have, and honestly, this is just for the council. This wasn't an attack on you folks. It's a frustration because I don't understand where the stoppage is right now. I would just like an explanation to the public. If this is going to be delayed, yeah. what's the legitimate reason? If not, right. can we get a vote as well, soon that as possible? Well, that would be a question for the administration. Yeah. Exactly. Council. Okay. Councilor Jones has a comment related Thank you. to this. Yes. And I'm sorry to do this, but no. it is inappropriate to call the councillors by their first names up here. Oh, I'm so sorry. We are, it's I'm Councillor sorry. Benton. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. I have a question for Mr. Rael. I can empathize with the frustration. Uh, you are correct that they have not been in compliance for several years, uh, you public, and, are st and we're being paid for a long time after the, you know, their enri original contract was uh, expired. I know this council gave them some extensions and the administration. But it's been frustrating to see what has gone on, and I'd like to ask Mr. Rael the question, uh, where are we at with this process? Ms. Uh, Madam Vice Chair and Councillor Sanchez and members of the Council, the, uh, the uh, RFP was, was issued and we had respondents to the RFP. Uh, there were several of the respondents that were, uh, that were reviewed by our procurement office and uh, were determined to be uh, not meeting the requirements of the RFP. There has been a committee that has reviewed it. Um, that proposal is in, is in the mayor's office and we are reviewing that and it is our intent to uh, bring that to the council. I know that our staff has been briefing you all about the status of the situation. We're equally as frustrated as you all are because we did not necessarily get the responses we thought we were gonna get, but uh, we're moving the issue forward and it should be before the council, uh, we should be able to introduce that uh, into the next council meeting. Because channel 26, the current uh, uh, provider is no longer doing services with the city and the station has gone black, is that correct? Um, Madam Vice Chair and Councilor uh, Sanchez, that's correct in general. However, we are gonna step into to do some of that work, to provide some programming in that station so it is not completely dark, but we are as interested, as, as I said earlier, in getting this resolved, uh, but it has been a, a challenge simply because of the, the, the issues associated with the number of folks that have responded and, and the fact that most of them did not uh, complete the proposal as it was uh, first uh, sent out. So, but we are moving forward on it. And I hope we can get it done as quickly as possible because again, the ratepayers are paying for this service and, and not being provided uh, a station because the station is black. I agree, totally. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Danny X, followed by John Paul Jones, followed by Leela Salim. After President Obama was reelected to his second term, he too wanted to do something about the epidemic of crime across America. He contacted and talked to Mr. Richard Ho, a highly decorated Marine who had done, tour, had done tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. Mr. Richard Ho told the president that there could never be a solution to stop crime in America. America's culture is one of crime and violence. He said, when you wage endless wars worldwide, sending your young men and women to kill for decades, you're saying that to kill and violence is how we solve our problems. This seeps into our social fabric, which gives citizens the mindset that violence is how we deal with our issues. Mr. Ho also stated, also stated, we have militarized our nation and militarized our cities. The police are like occupying armies in our neighborhoods. They show up like Nazi stormtroopers dressed in war armor, rolling in on in military like tanks and bulldozers, shutting down neighborhoods for hours. The people feel under assault and under siege by the police that should be protecting them. So yeah, the people will fight, black, will fight back. 
the bloodthirsty, murderous death cult called the NRA has made an American killing field to the, the byproduct of the sick and twisted idea of the Second Amendment. They have watered down gun laws, so now everybody has a gun. 320 million people, 340 million guns. So hold on, folks, because you ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you, sir. John Paul Jones, followed by Leela Salim, followed by Mark Horton. Mr. Jones? Uh, yes, on the, May 21st, I sent each of you a letter concerning uh, public health issues and the asylum seekers. Uh, in that letter, I uh, mentioned four areas that I've had experience with or read about uh, uh, that are massive public health problems uh, related to the migration of people. That was the introduction of uh, cholera into Haiti, uh, certainly the HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, the Hajj in Saudi Arabia where hundreds of people normally die uh, because of the mixture of people that have come into the country. And then the one that affected me when the Australian government felt that I might be bringing in plague or cholera. And they had procedures in place to prevent that sort of thing. And indeed, I might have been, except that they had those procedures there. So I have a lot of concerns because I have not seen this issue addressed. We have almost a perfect storm of uh, conditions that could create a serious problem uh, in public health because we are allowing asylum seekers to come into this country. Most of them are very poor. They've not had uh, proper public health uh, measures taken in their own country and all of a sudden they're here. And I don't know if they're being evaluated and how that might impact us. I like the, com the comment that there is no aisle here. This is a bipartisan issue. We should know what is happening for the people that are coming here and how to make sure that they do not negatively impact us by bringing diseases here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Leela Salim, followed by Mark Horton, followed by Candace Brower. Good evening, Madam Vice President and Counselors. My name is Leila Salim, and I've been advocating for ranked choice voting for some time. I truly believe that having an instant runoff is the best way to elect the candidate that the most voters are happy with. Since we amended our city charter to require that council and mayoral candidates earn 50% of votes, we're already halfway there to rank choice. The main difference is that with our current system, all but two candidates are eliminated after the first round. But with ranked choice voting, only one candidate is eliminated after the first round. This gives other candidates a chance to be more competitive in later rounds. And this leads to a better consensus from voters. It's a proven voting method that many cities in the US are moving to and many countries outside the US have been doing for years. Along with my fellow advocates, I was surprised to see that the bill with three sponsors that we've been advocating for was still stuck in committee, but a new competing RCV bill somehow got through committee and is now before the council. I thank you for bringing the first one forward tonight. The state law does not require that this type of change go before the voters. The city of Las Cruces adopted it by ordinance unanimously. And the main reason that we would like this to be done by ordinance is that so it can go into effect this year because the consolidated election is now in November and we really don't wanna have a runoff election during the busy holiday season. So now is the time to make this change that will save taxpayer money and increase voter turnout Please support ranked choice voting for the 2019 election. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mark Horton, followed by Candace Brower, followed by Gerald Cuty. Sir? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to address the council. I am uh, currently receiving um, support from supportive housing, and I've heard some discussion, I believe, in the city in regards to the abandoned houses that um, are a problem, a nuisance. Um, and, and it seems like the city Let's might see. be leaning towards uh, becoming landlord to, uh, to acquire these houses. And I don't know what direction that's going in. 
But I, I see no reason why the public can't be given the opportunity for home ownership, particularly those of us that might be already uh, receiving funds from the city and state. Um, I believe in a computer, uh, the communities could easily support uh, this type of initiative and would welcome a homeowner as opposed to someone who might want to just flip the house or um, the, uh, the city becoming a landlord over who knows how many years. So uh, I, I'd like to present the idea to, to the council that we have some discussion in that regard. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Let me just respond and say, uh, as a quick reminder, uh, during our budget process and the one the mayor just signed tonight included and uh, included some funding uh, for us to work on that. And another resolution we passed was uh, Councilor Gibson's to accept some of her, the earlier community reports and to fund the implementation of programs like that. So I encourage you to get with our staff and figure out when those uh, meetings will start to be held so that you can participate in that. But we've taken those first steps to begin implementing it. I encourage you to come back and work with us over the summer. Great, I will. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Horton. Um, Candace Brower, followed by Kitty Kiyutu, followed by Sally Beers, followed by Linda Starr. Good evening, counselors. My name is Candace Brower, and I'm a resident of District 4. First, I would like to thank counselors Benton, Davis, and Winter for co-sponsoring the ordinance for ranked choice voting, for which I am here today to express my support. It is well known that incumbents tend to prefer whatever voting system got them elected in the first place. So it is to the credit of councillors Benton and Davis that they would put the interests of the voters before their own, given that they are both up for re-election this fall. The most important reason for adopting RCV by ordinance rather than putting it to a vote is that we would immediately save up to a million dollars this year alone. In my own district, four, five candidates are competing for the seat left open by Brad Winter's retirement, virtually guaranteeing the need for a runoff election. Why force voters to choose their top candidate in November only to return in December to register their backup choices when all this could be accomplished at once using a ranked choice ballot? As for the idea of leaving it up to the voters to decide whether to adopt ranked choice voting, I believe it is the city council's responsibility in this case to do what is in the best interests of voters. Albuquerque voters made their wishes clear back in 2013 when they voted to switch from a plurality system to a majority system, so there's no reason to ask them this question again. Given that Santa Fe and Las Cruces have already approved ranked choice voting by ordinance, our own city council should follow suit and adopt this common sense reform. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Gerald Kiyutu, is that right? I'm sorry. That's pretty good. Uh, good evening, counselors. My name is Jerry Kiyutu, uh, and I'm a resident in District 4 also. Councillor Harris's uh, ranked choice voting proposal, which was passed out of committee by a majority, cites good reasons why RCV should be implemented. Those same benefits were cited in the proposed RCV Municipal Elections Ordinance Amendment, sponsored by Councillors Benton, Davis, and Winter. Ranked choice voting will be a clear improvement over the current runoff system put in place by voters in 2013. Because of the numerous advantages of RCV, in particular, saving the city millions of dollars over the next several years, I question putting RCV to another city vote rather than implementing it directly by ordinance. The people have already demonstrated a preference for majority winners for mayoral and councilor elections. If RCV is hardwired into the city charter by vote, it will be more difficult to make incremental adjustments later. Furthermore, if RCV is approved by vote in 2019, it could not go into effect until later, whereas if it were instituted as an ordinance now, it could be implemented in the city elections later this year, potentially saving the city a million and a half dollars, a million dollars, a half million dollars or more. I urge you all 
to expeditiously implement ranked choice voting by ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sally Beers, followed by Linda Starr, followed by Lucille Long. Good evening, city council members. Uh, my name is Sally Beers. I'm a resident of District 6. I understand some of the members of the council feel that the issue of ranked cho choice voting, as it has to do with voting in elections, needs to go to the voters. I respectfully urge you to reconsider this stance. State law clearly allows for cities, such as Albuquerque, that already have a runoff system in its charter to change from a top two runoff to a ranked choice runoff and do this by ordinance. Look at our neighbor, Las Cruces. It's the second largest city in the state and historically also has had dismal voter turnout. turnout. Not only did their governing, governing body do right by their residents by adopting ranked choice by ordinance, but they did so unanimously. Those who were going to be running in this up, upcoming election, including the mayor, were 100% behind this. They rightly made this decision because it's good policy that, that will encourage voter engagement and turnout. They also felt that saving up to a million taxpayer dollars is also good governance. This is money that the city of Las Cruces could spend on more worthwhile projects rather than on unnecessary runoff elections. I ask you please make the correct and courageous decision as is your duty to uh, do right by the residents of this great city and adopt rank choice by ordinance unanimously as the governing body of Las Cruces did. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Linda, uh, please halt with any applause. Linda Starr, followed by Lucille Long, followed by Athena Christo Dulu. Linda Good Starr. evening, counselors. Uh, my name is Linda Starr, and I'm um, in District 6, and I've been a resident of Albuquerque for going on 47 years, and um, I love it here, and I'll never leave until the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to express my opinion on ranked choice voting. I, I think that we should not put obstacles in voters' way. Uh, we should make it as easy as possible for voters to get out the vote, um, to get out there and vote. We, we shouldn't put uh, we, we shouldn't make it harder for them to vote and, and have them vote more often confusing things. So we should make it as simple as we can for them to get out and vote. And that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Lucille Long, followed by Athena Christo Dulu, followed by Eric Shim Shimamoto. Uh, Ms. Long? Good evening, counselors. I just wanted to um, um, commend all the leaders um, of the community of Albuquerque, the mayor, and everyone who engaged. I'm with the Knob Hill Neighborhood Association, and I'm on their public safety committee, so I just want to commend the leaders of our city for bringing in state police and Bernalillo County sheriffs to collaborate to help um, stop crime that is just so out of control in this city. Um, I also am here to talk about uh, needles in the parks again. I brought this up at the last meeting and needles in public spaces. We do not have a true needle exchange program. We are seeing excess needles in the parks and um, needle users in the parks homeless trash, and many issues that continue to burden our citizens and make it unsafe for children to play in our parks. Children's, children should be free and not have to worry about getting stabbed by needles in any of our public spaces. Um, some of the, the issues that we've proposed are true needle exchange programs, 
um, by having the user self-dispense. The other ideas we came up with were, with the Navajo Association was drug zone free and having park rangers that could work with APD, collaborate with APD. So those were the things we, we wanted to talk about. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Okay, Athena Krista Dulu, is that correct? Is that close enough? Yes, it is. Athena Krista Dulu. President Sanchez, city councilors, my name is Athena Krista Dulu, and I also live in district number four. And I want to thank my uh, city councilor, Brad Winter, <coughs> for all the many years of good work that he's done in my district. One other thing that I want to bring up is that I'm actually a candidate for city district four. And so this idea of having ranked choice voting is very close to me, as I understand that it not only eliminates the need for a runoff and saves the district money, but it keeps the voting and the election process, the campaigning in a much more con convivial, congenial manner, so that I will remain friends with one of the other candidates. <laughs> So in that sense, I would like you to pass the ordinance and not leave it to the November election to enforce or in, to begin ranked choice voting. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Eric Shimamoto, followed by Maureen Shoran. Hi. Uh, Madam Vice Chair and Counselors, that, Eric Shimamoto, that's correct. Uh, and I'm also here to support the uh, adoption of ranked choice voting by way of ordinance. So that would be 1954. <clears throat> As others have already mentioned, uh, Albuquerque already has a 50% runoff election system. So really the biggest effect that this has is it doesn't force voters to come out a second time during the, during the holiday season. And it saves us the money of having to open the polls a second time. And as others have mentioned, that could be up to a million dollars. Uh, especially when you figure in all of the candidates who have public financing that would be funded for the runoff period. Um, uh, so I urge you to do this by ordinance uh, for this year's election and also to those counselors who have concerns about the process because doing it by ordinance allows the council to retain the ability to adjust the system if there are tweaks that are, that are desirable in the future before the uh, mayoral election in 2021. Um, and I understand that, that County Clerk Stover is ready to, ready to administer a ranked choice uh, election this year. Um, so, uh, uh, so that flexibility that I mentioned is created by state law that allows this legislative body to adopt this system this year. So let's save a million dollars this year by enacting ranked choice voting by ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Maureen Skullran, followed by Stephen Baca, followed by Paul Ryan McKinney. My name is Maureen Skullran. I'm in District 8. I'm here to support ranked choice voting, specifically you making the ordinance. I should mention that I'm also a council candidate. I'm in a two-person race, but whether there's two people, ten people, I still think it's a good idea. And here's why I think it's a good thing for you to do and not for us to do. Now, normally, You'd want to give voters more choices. But this putting ranked choice voting into effect will not harm anyone. It won't harm any candidates. It doesn't favor any particular stripe. And it gives the voters more choices. Not only are you saving them a trip to the polls, but you also don't have to worry about wasted votes or strategic voting. You don't have to figure out well, is this person really electable? You can just pick who you think is the top people. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Stephen Baca, followed by Paul Ryan McKinney, followed Hello. by Art Tenenbaum. Good evening. Good evening, city councilors. Uh, my name is Stephen Baca. I am also a city council candidate in uh, District 2. However, I am against putting ranked choice voting through ordinance. Uh, in fact, I'm against it in general. It largely favors the incumbent. Uh, Pete Denali did a scathing article on this that ranked choice voting does favor the incumbent drastically, and to put this ordinance through before on this coming, upcoming election is almost uh, election rigging, in my opinion. It, it completely and utterly gives uh, favor to the incumbent, and it should not be put through. I, 
If it does be put through, however, I don't agree with it, it should be put through by uh, voters. Voters ultimately have the say, and they should ultimately have the say for this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Paul Ryan McKinney, followed by Art Tannenbaum, followed by David Tenorio. Mr. You, McKinney. Thank you, Vice President Councilors. I want to speak a little bit about uh, this 019-60, making it a crime to stand within 200 feet of people that are drag racing. And I'll make sure I'm clear on everything because you tax us and take money to put in sidewalks and, and, uh, and, and maintain them. And then you tax us some more to tell us to use those sidewalks. And then now you want to make it a crime for standing on the sidewalk. I mean, it, it seems a little bit crazy to me. You could have some fella getting out of work on Montgomery, walking down the road, a couple idiots drag racing, he don't know what's going on. All of a sudden the cops show up and he's like, he really don't know what's going on. He's trying to walk home and next thing he knows, he's getting a citation. Saying, what the heck, I'm a poor cook, I'm getting a citation for, for what? And, and this is the implication. We remind there is no crime so small that the government's not willing to kill you over. When you look at Eric Garner selling untaxed cigarettes, you look here in Albuquerque, New Mexico State Police here, two shootings that started with traffic stops, one driving. I mean, that's just absolute craziness. I mean, are we going to make more victimless crime laws? I mean, who are these people hurting? They're standing on the sidewalks that they paid for. I mean, if you want to try to shut down drag racing, figure out how to shut down drag racing. They're already breaking a number of laws. But the idea that somebody on the sidewalk should get a ticket because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time is absolutely insane. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tannenbaum, followed by David Tenorio, followed by Rich Weiner. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Chairperson Borrego, it's nice to see you, even though I can't see you from here. <laughs> Anyhow, it's great to see you and hear all of the people who are getting engaged in the government. I really like that. Uh, getting back to the, the rules of decorum, those were instituted after the big public uprising five years ago. I don't know if everyone is aware of that. They were kind of hastily uh, instituted, and I noticed there have been some changes recently. And, uh, you know, that's one of my gripes with the council is they're, they're always changing the rules. Also, on page two of the agenda, if, if you legislators and rule makers and members of the public, maybe members of the administration, if you look at the public comments section on page two of the agenda, it's the most convoluted policy imaginable. It's, confu it's unnecessarily complicated. It's confusing. Anyhow, uh, I just wanted to point out that a million dollars is one-tenth of one percent of the city's annual budget. I don't like the idea of election meddling. If you want to sell out the, the elections process for a million dollars, I don't know if there's anything I can do to stop you. But I would suggest that there's enough fraud, waste, and abuse in the municipal government currently that a million dollars could be saved overnight. The political establishment's credibility relies on the public trust. And I think uh, members of the establishment should uh, really bear down and get back to earning the public trust instead of foisting things on the public. That's the way I see it, and thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Mr. David Tenorio, followed by Rich Weiner, followed by Marianne Maestas. Okay. Hello, members of the council. My name is David Tenorio, and I live in District 5. So Albuquerque's voting turnout last, uh, last, during the last mayoral election reached 27% of registered voters, which is not very high. Furthermore, more than two-thirds of the voters who did turn out were white, and more than two-thirds of those voters were also over the age of 50. So we have a problem in Albuquerque regarding voting and our elections. These numbers are undeniable. Voters who turn out for elections and are ultimately making the decisions as to who is going to be elected do not at all reflect the demographic makeup of our city. So remember, 68% of the voters who turn out to vote here are white. Albuquerque is over 60% people of color. 68% of the voters who turn out to vote are over 50, almost 50% 50 of adults are 
under 50. So if this governing body is serious about upholding the values enshrined in our US Constitution and state law regarding voting rights, I hope it'll make governing decisions that will increase access to the polls to the voters who are currently not participating in our democratic process, people of color and young people. Ranked choice voting is proven definitively through hard data collected in cities that use, that use it compared with cities that do not to increase voter turnout and increase the diversity of the electorate. I encourage this body to consider the merits of passing this bill by ordinance as state law allows and as is required of you as public servants to uphold your oath of office and to keep the best interests of your constituents in heart. Being part of District 5, I know that our district in the 2017 election would have saved plenty of money on our runoff election. Voters have already decided that we want a runoff system that yields a majority winner, and we already have that system in place. You can make a decision about which algorithm to use to best serve the community and save our government money. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Rich Weiner, followed by Marianne Maestas, followed by Gus Pedrotti. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, uh, City Councilors. Uh, I am a longtime supporter of ranked choice voting. I want to thank, uh, I live in District 6. I want to thank my counselor, Pat Davis, uh, as well as uh, counselors Benton and Winter for uh, sponsoring the ranked choice voting ordinance. And I want to also urge you, as others have done, to do it by ordinance, uh, not putting it to the voters. And uh, several of the reasons, one is I want to see this happen this fall. One thing uh, that has been pointed out that uh, uh, the mayor and city clerk have indicated that they would not want to see the first implementation of ranked choice voting be in a mayor election. They want to see it non-mayoral election. That means if it's not this year, it would be 2023, four years from now. That's a lot of years to go uh, without giving the voters more choices that ranked choice voting gives, as opposed to fewer choices. It saves money. It avoids the December runoff. Um, there are many reasons for, for that. Uh, in addition, if we're going to put the uh, issue to the voters, there's going to need to be a strong education campaign and uh, money expended by the city in addition to the cost of the ballot because there's been, there, there, there is known to be lots of misinformation out there by big money to interest when these ballot campaigns happen. And, and uh, Santa Fe spent considerable money on an education campaign and, and, and succeeded. So we would need to do that in addition, but I would prefer to see us go straight to an ordinance uh, and get this done as soon as possible. I also want to point out that, that uh, two uh, incumbents who are running have, are supporting ranked choice voting, and also two insurgents who are running uh, have indicated tonight that they also uh, support ranked choice voting. So I, I don't see the likelihood that it necessarily supports incumbents or any one particular person. It supports those who have broadest support. That's the important point. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Marianne Maestas, followed by Gus Pedrotti, followed by Tad Naminsky, and our last speaker is Juan Avila. Would you all come forward, please? Hello, council members. My name is Marianne Maestas, and I currently live in District 2. It's my understanding that the city of Albuquerque um, will save a considerable amount of taxpayer money if this body decides to adopt ranked choice voting, as um, many of the people before me have stated already. I have seen figures ranging from about half a million to a million dollars. With several candidates running for at least one of the city council races, we are almost certainly going to have a runoff. I also understand that it is the city, the county clerk, my, sorry, um, that will be administering the election and the runoff as well. The county clerk has stated that even if there's just one council race that goes to a runoff, her office has to open all voting convenience centers in the city for that run runoff as per state law. This means staffing all 19 of them. There is no way to administer a runoff election on the cheap and Albuquerque will have to pay for it. The city clerk has said we shouldn't implement on a mayoral year because it is too big election to be doing this for the first time. But it is the county clerk's office that will be administering the election. Um, and her office has said that they are prepared to implement in 2019 or 2021. Um, it doesn't make a difference to them. Why not adopt ranked choice voting by ordinance for this upcoming election? Putting this question to the voters without investing in educating the voters on the issue is not leadership. 
and it doesn't keep the city from spending close to a million dollars on an unnecessary election this year. These taxpayer dollars can be used, can be saved by not having to spend it on administering a whole second election. It could be used for educating the voters on the new system and engaging voters to actually participate and really empowering them. This would be remarkable and show a tremendous amount of leadership from this body. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gus Padrotti, followed by Tad Naminsky, and followed by Juan Avila. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Hello, counselors. Uh, my name is Gus Padrotti. I'm a recovering candidate. Um, and <laughs> most importantly, I mean, first of all, like, wow, what a public comment tonight. I've learned so much, and it's made me legitimately excited. I knew that ranked choice voting was something that I was into, but I didn't realize how good of an idea it was until I just hung out. So I'm also kind of ditching class, so thanks to everyone who gave me a good reason to ditch class. Um, but I'm enthralled with this. We have precedent around the state that shows us we can take this action. We have precedent in our communities asking for reform in the way that we do elections towards majority. And we also have an electorate that even though 27 is a low percentage for turnout in the mayoral election, we have an electorate that's saying we're increasing. We want more, we are ready for more. And that's why ranked choice voting is so exciting because it is this new path to engagement. It no longer gives us a limiting binary where we have to make a decision and say we've done our duty and voting is the least we can do in this electorate. You know that, it's not the most, it's an obligation more than anything. And it gives us the opportunity to find out why it matters for us to engage this discourse called campaigns. Campaigns are not about name recognition. Campaigns are about us putting forward competitive ideas from our communities, engaging our communities to find the impact of those ideas and affect them. And that's why this body exists, to steward the effectiveness of those ideas. And clearly there has been a community that has come forward tonight with their facts ready, with historical trends, and is asking you to make sure that cities remain the battleground of democracy and are the most fun place we can live as an electorate. Because we get to move at the rate of change that is important to us that is accessible to us and keeps us excited about our future. So I'm so happy to stand here before you today supporting ranked choice voting, ensuring that this is hopefully something that you pass when this gets to come to vote next because it is important that we get it done this election. Don't put it off for another two, four, six, eight. I don't know, if it doesn't get done, what does it get done, right, counselors? Like, that's the motto, get the work done when you can. And see that we have a more engaged electorate thanks to this process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bedrotti. We love your energy. Mr. Naminsky. Thank you. My name is Ted Nemitsky. Well, here is, I hear plenty about cri how, how much crime is in the city. Well, this weekend, okay. on the bus, well, one bus they go up right here at a depot in downtown for an hour and a half, waiting for the cop to show up. They, I, I mean to cops to show up at least an hour and a half to downtown depot. So anyway, now criminals are everywhere all over downtown. Stealing, drug, everything goes right here. That brings me now to young, young fellow sp spoke to not less city councilmen about before. And that time, well, he outlined that everything such beautifully correct, co that's about nine years old kids, quite beautifully. Anyway, I applaud something like that. That time, city cop, Gunderson, look at me, give me a dirty look. And, and I know that he's looking at Clarissa Kenya. Well, I look at, look at Clarissa Pena. She, she show up what she's made up of it. Such evil, angry look, possessed by Satan. That's best I can, I can describe. I wonder why she didn't show up last sit to council meeting. Anyway, how much I need of time? I can explore another issue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our last speaker, Mr. Avila. Hello, Madam Council. Thank you, for, thank you for giving me the time today. I'm here in support and talking about ranked choice voting. Um, I'm here, I, excuse me if I begin to mumble my words, I just got a long day to work, but I was here, in the, I was here under the understanding, I was here to support, ask you guys to 
pass that as a city ordinance. But to my surprise, I see that you guys are putting it up to the voters to do so. And um, I just, I want to ask what's, what's the dislike to ranked choice voting? I encourage any of you to come up and talk to me and give me any negative, anything that could potentially come that would negatively affect our community from ranked choice voting. Uh, it encourages people to participate. It encourages people to be part of the democracy. And it, from, this, from my side of the stage over here, it just seems like we're afraid of a little competition. I mean, it, it's, that's ultimately what's, what Ring Shows Voters is bringing here. It's opening the doors for people like us to be able to be part of this, uh, this council, be part of the community we are so engaged with. Uh, there's so many people against, and I've heard some people mention a, a few articles from a gentleman, Pete Donnelly. Um, I looked into it. I mean, he was born in a generation where half of the population in the world wasn't even alive. I mean, this, our, <laughs> our system has changed so much that we have to embrace the change that we're asking for. And we have to look at something different. We have so many great people running for, for council. And we have to give them a chance. And I think this is the way that we're going to do it. And this is the way we're going to encourage it. And if you don't pass this in an ordinance, I welcome the competition. We will be out there canvassing. We will, there, we, will, we will be there knocking on people's doors, making sure this does pass. So you either start now or we'll see you. We'll see you next time. Mr. Avila, thank you. Um, Councillor Jones and Councillor Gibson both thank have you. comments. Thank you. Just one comment, sir, and that is someday you will be older than half of the generation and you will also be obsolete. <laughs> no, 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 if you're lucky. If and you're lucky. So thank you. No comment. Room. Just want to let you know. Counselor. If you're lucky, this happens. If not, you don't have to worry about it. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Gibson. Uh, I, I absolutely have to go along with that, but need to make one, one little bit of a a correction there, that was also during the time when we had pterodactyls flying. So it's been quite a while ago. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Avalila, I just want to let you know that both bills are going to be considered. So uh, just for your understanding and clarification. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So we are going to move on. That concludes our public uh, comments. And we will move on to announcements. And we have three announcements on the agenda. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Madam Vice President. There will be a Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting on Monday, June 10 at 5 p.m. in a Council Committee room on the ninth floor. Councillor Benton. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Vice President. There will be a Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee meeting on Wednesday, June 12th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chamber. And Councillor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. I have two. Uh, as a reminder, uh, this coming Friday, uh, June 7th at 3.30 p.m., the public is invited to join us at the Albuquerque Sunport to welcome back uh, our honor flight of northern New Mexico veterans. A number of uh, current and uh, former uh, service members are escorting our New Mexico veterans to D.C. to visit memorials to their service and will be returning this Friday. I also want to remind folks in the city that uh, Pride Month has officially begun, and this week it kicks off a whole round of events. Uh, Councilor Gibson and I are hosting a group of young LGBTQ youth at, and service members and veterans at the United uh, Pride game this Wednesday night, thanks to support and sponsorship from Pride and uh, from folks in our districts. Uh, Friday morning at 10 a.m. in Knob Hill, uh, will be the mayor and uh, community members will be making a special announcement uh, to honor and celebrate our LGBT community uh, here in Al the city of Albuquerque. Uh, Friday night is a family-friendly event at the Expo New Mexico for Pride, and of course we invite you to our best parade of the year, Saturday morning uh, in Knob Hill, 10 a.m., uh, it's a huge event and one of our largest parades in the city is our Pride Parade this Saturday. And so we encourage everybody to get out, support the community, and enjoy uh, these first few days of Pride Month this year. And Councillor Davis, do you also not have a, a candlelight vigil one evening? Uh, that is usually on the Friday night. Before on Friday yesterday. night. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So we, um, we will move on to item number 12, which is public hearings, and there are none. So we will move on to approvals. And I would like to um, introduce EC 415, Agreement with Honorable Nan Nash to provide services as a hearing officer. Second. 
There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Counselors, no discussion. All in favor, signify by saying yes. 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 And Councilor Pena, that was a yes. Um, any yes. opposition? No, that passes unanimously. So that will take us to final actions. And um, tonight we have six items on the agenda. Um, on seven, with Councilor Benton's. Okay, so Councilor Winter. Oh, Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, this is um, O-60, and I've been looking forward to this discussion for a while. This is amending Chapter 8, Article 2, Part 4, Section 6 of the Revised Ordinance of Albuquerque, the traffic code relating to racing on streets and drag racing, prohibiting um, street racing on city streets, prohibiting spectators of racing, um, street racing, and they also call it drag racing, but I'm calling it street racing because there is legalized drag racing at drag strips. Um, or spectating preparations of the same, and I do move it do pass. And I, let, let me kind of tell you all how this got started. And I think you all probably have some of the same issues I do, and I can remember years and years ago, we used to have street racing on Montgomery. We still have it on Paseo del Norte, but it was a little different because I think folks would go and um, they would kind of hook up with some other people racing and would race it. But So I got a, a call from a, a neighbor that lives right off of San Mateo and, and um, Alameda, and San Pedro, San, Alameda and San Pedro and said that they've been racing over there at Balloon Fiesta Drive. And so he wanted me to come down and see it. And he said it usually, the most organized part of it is Sunday nights, a certain time they all show up. And so I went over there. And so I drove down Alameda, turned right on San Mateo, dead end at Balloon Fiesta Drive and turned right and went up um, going east on Bloom Fiesta Drive, and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was, and I'm, I'm try not to exaggerate on this, but I swear there were 300 cars lined up on both sides of the street as spectators, and then the street racers were, and I was in the line of the street racers going up, queuing to race down Bloom Fiesta Drive on the north side, and so I, it was just amazing. I couldn't. I could not believe what I saw. It was straight out of Fast and Furious movie, if you've seen that. And so we did um, try to get the police there, and it was a really busy night. And eventually what happens, they come. And, and I'm going to let, I do have, um, I think, Commander Wesley and Commander Burke to talk about it a little bit. But it's, it's a difficult situation for the police to handle. Um, and I think that a lot of the street racers are feeling a little like they can do whatever they feel like doing. And um, so Chris helped me. We, we looked at different things that we could do that were around the country. And, and I'm not sure if what this bill will do will work, but I know that there's been about 10 cities or counties that have implemented um, citing spectators. And this isn't citing spectators on Montgomery watching them. This is they deal with Facebook. They get and they all know where they're going. And so this is, is a little bit different. I'm not sure if this will work. I think San Diego, um, they implemented it. A year later, they had 99% success in this, and so it could work. But what I'm hoping is this will get a bigger discussion because it is absolutely a safety issue, what we've seen on some tragic accidents in the city, and it's a quality of life issue. And you get a lot of phone calls about the noise and excessive noise all hours. And so um, I... I I think I'd like to turn it over to the commanders that are here, and I think lieutenants, and just take, to ask questions and discuss it a little. And then I do have um, a gentleman from the drag race that provides access to street racers at the drag race for a very reasonable price, and I want him to talk a little bit too. Okay, officers, good evening. Thank you for coming down. Good evening. Um, my name is Commander Joe Burke and I am the commander of the Northeast Area Command. And in dealing with drag racing, it's become a significant problem. Um, I deal with it along Montgomery where it's more of a spontaneous type of drag racing. But what Councilor Winter is talking about over off of Alameda and San Mateo is a more organized and <laughs> planned event where when police try to get involved or try to enforce any type of laws, it becomes a little bit chaotic. Um, and it 
presents a significant public safety issue when we approach the scene and we have 100 to 300 individuals scurrying out of the area. We will not chase these individuals. It's a, it's a safety issue. Um, we're not gonna pursue them. But what my concern is always is the public safety of when they're leaving, them trying to exit the area quickly and then cause an accident or sometimes some type of serious fatality. So I believe any ordinance that would help us um, enforce and the, the law of drag racing and pedestrians watching drag racing, I think it would benefit and, and give us a little bit more teeth in our options to enforce the law and to curb this type of activity. And what we're really trying to do is d d deter this. Um, I've also gone out in that area that uh, Council Member Winter was uh, speaking about, and he's not exaggerating when he says there's 300 cars, you have your spectators, and then you have the cars that are actually racing out there. And my officers will go out there and do what we call tactical operation plans. And you go to an area, when they see us driving up, they're getting out of that area as quick as they possibly can. So um, it, it's definitely a, a serious public safety concern. And any type of enforcement that will help us to get a control on this, um, we're all for it. I'm Commander Rivera with the Traffic Division. Um, sadly, we respond to, many, to too many fatals and serious injury crashes, but anything that can help uh, curb any type of in injury crash um, will help us. And it, you know, these guys, they deal with it daily. I unfortunately go to fatals way too often, and I think this is just waiting to happen, um, especially in that area you're talking about, Councilman. Vice President and Council, just so what happens is, in, and we've got some other things we're going to try to do at Bloom Fiesta to, to move them away, but then what they do is they go to your all's area and they do the same thing. And what happens on a Sunday night, if police do show up, they'll leave and they'll go someplace else. And then if police show up there, they might come back to where they're at. So it's just a constant, you know, cat and mouse game. So, Councilor Gibson and then Councilor Sanchez and then Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, I agree, this has been a problem. This is something that Commander Burke, you, you and, and, and have helped us, you know, come up with um, some solutions. Um, uh, but we, I absolutely agree, we need to give APD tools so that, you know, so that arrests can start being made. And, um, and, and that will really, I believe over time, really deter. When they start realizing that, hey, this is really going to be an inconvenience, among other things, besides being expensive, and now you've got something on your record. Um, you, you know, uh, that can only be a good thing. Um, so um, I, I really want to support this, uh, although, and I, I understand what you're doing as far as, you know, uh, making it so that you can also arrest the, the spectators. I, I get that. Uh, I don't think it's going to be some guy walking by just willy-nilly that you, you're going to be interested in, but obviously the people who are out there almost as if it's a picnic um, to, to, uh, to watch this as, as a spectator sport. Um, but I would ask our, our uh, council attorney if you know, where else has this happened and what repercussions, if any, have, have, have they seen? Thank you, Madam Vice President and Councillor Gibson. As Councillor Win Winter mentioned, um, the first city to kind of initiate this approach was San Diego. They were dealing with um, a pretty significant drag racing problem at the time and they did have um, pretty positive results with it. Um, that was around 10 years ago. And since that time, um, a number of other cities have, have taken it up as well, a number in California and elsewhere. Um, the literature and kind of analysis of this approach suggests that it's been helpful in the cities that have dealt with this issue um, and that they've seen some success in employing the, the spectator liability issue. So if I may, just one follow-up question. So what would the charge be and, and, and uh, um, you know, is there a fine or jail time or what? Madam President, this is uh, added to the city's traffic code. 
So it's the same penalty that is applied generally in the traffic code for any violation of the traffic code, whether it be speeding, um, illegal park, well, parking's a little bit different, um, but a, a typical traffic violation found in our traffic code is punishable as a petty misdemeanor, which is punishable by citation up to a maximum fine of $500, or I believe it's 90 days in jail. That's the authority that the city has to criminalize um, behavior that presents a safety and, and health threat within the city, so it would be that same penalty. Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. I am having a very difficult time with this legislation, and I want to ask the commander regarding the number of police officers that we have today on the Albuquerque Police Department. You know, when people are calling 911, uh, they are waiting for a long time with a priority one call. I mean, this may be a priority, but if you've got 300 spectators at, at an event, and you've got several calls that are coming in for priority one calls, how are you going to arrest spectators watching a street race? So, it, it, Madam Vice President and, and Councilor Sanchez, it, it does present a, a staffing issue. It, it is labor intensive um, for the officers to go out there and enforce this law. But I think, I think it's vital. Um, we have to take some type of initiative to enforce this type of activity to show the seriousness of the potential risks that are involved. Um, the, the hundreds to 300 individuals that are spectating these races do, do pose a, a public safety issue. If there's an accident there, if somebody drives off the road, it, it would pose a significant um, hazard to those individuals in the area. And I think that it would um, benefit the Albuquerque Police Department to enforce this type of ordinance to show that th this is a serious incident that needs serious enforcement. And I agree, because we do have street racing going on now, and it's a major problem in our city. But I mean, how we can't even stop these street racers? How are we going to stop these spectators going to these races? It's, it, it's a challenge. We, we would have to put forth um, significant resources to, to investigate it, um, utilize some of our intelligence officers to help us provide those resources and garner the support to enforce these laws. Thank you. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, thanks, Commanders, for this. I, I wanted to ask just a couple of targeted questions to help get at the, the meat here. Um, first, I'll ask Mr. Melendrez, because I know you worked on this, uh, and maybe uh, also to our city attorney. Um, so in the specifics of this, how is probable cause articulated in terms of allowing an, uh, getting far enough along that an officer can articulate, I saw them do X, that we can demonstrate to a court? Madam Vice President and Councilor Davis, so the, the way the ordinance is drafted, um, it says that if somebody is within 200 feet of the event um, for the purpose of viewing the event, um, that would be sufficient to issue a citation. So to the extent that an officer identifies those observable facts, that would be sufficient um, for issuing the citation. Obviously, due process being what it is, that's subject to challenge in Metro Court if, if the spectator wants to do that. Sure, and so we're gonna, uh, thank you, Madam Vice President, so just to clarify, to sort of address a comment or a concern we heard from public comment earlier. Um, if, again, this is not something, as you said, Commander, this is not somebody who's just in the parking lot of Montgomery and turns their head to see a car drive by fast, but if, for example, our police officers are encountering a herd of people um, at a deliberate location at night that's generally close to the public or not very uh, articulated and they were to observe for a minute and see, say, six people standing on the start line watching a vehicle leave the start line and then watch those vehicles return, that's different than someone, say, just walking down the sidewalk or driving past in a parking lot and it's clear that that's the intent here. Is that correct? Madam so, Vice President, Councilor Davis, yes, that's correct. Thanks. Um, and I, either for you or Mr. Aguilar, if somebody could help me, how do we address any concerns that we might get about First Amendment issues, about the right to, or other sort of constitutional rights to assemble, rights, First Amendment to stand on the corner and sort of encourage folks on or do whatever? How do we art get around those? I'm, I'm not concerned. I think we've addressed those well, but I want to be sure we put that out in public and address those concerns. Uh, Madam Vice President, Councilor Davis, uh, certainly we we have to embrace those instead of getting around those issues head on, so we're happy to Thank take you. a look at that. Um, and 
up to up to this point, we haven't. But um, obviously, uh, you're on your your instincts are correct. I mean, there are uh, potential First Amendment issues. Um, we're we're dealing with some of those relating to sidewalks right. and medians and uh, another action that we're currently in litigation on. So, uh, but. Uh, I think that this is a good first step and we're happy to engage in that dialogue working with uh, Mr. Melendez and the council to make sure that uh, whatever product uh, the council decides on is enforceable and that we can make it work. And uh, just Mr. Madam Vice President, Mr. Aguilar, just to follow up, just to be sure we put this on the record. So if this council passes this legislation tonight, it's been my experience that APD issues special orders to tell officers how to enforce new laws. And so in our process to work on those SOPs, uh, as well established with the Department of Justice for community input through those processes, and we can work through those in order to figure out how best to do this to ensure that we're meeting our PC standard but also protecting those rights. Is that right? M Madam Vice President, Councillor Davis, that's uh, one direction to go. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Councillor, uh, can I follow one more question, Madam Vice President, and then I'm done, I promise. Uh, Commander Rivera, I just want to ask really quickly, uh, on the inverse of this, and not just adopt, not just um, enforcing against spectators who are helping to create a reason to bring all these folks together, but about the vehicles themselves. We continue to see some issues where uh, community members, and we can all hear these if your windows are open at night and you live near one of these places, um, we know these vehicles are modified in a way that doesn't meet uh, code, it doesn't meet ordinance, uh, illegal modifications for exhaust or for other things. How effective has APD been or has APD engaged in a TAC plan any time recently to do, say, instead of doing a speeding TAC plan, to say do a legal modification TAC plan for a certain amount of time to sort of target some of these vehicles, maybe not on their, when they're on race day, but certainly some that we know are engaging in this or you can clearly hear when they zip by you on the interstate or on Gibson or anywhere else? Madam Vice President, Councilor Chair, uh, uh, Davis, we have not done a TAC plan such as that, but that's a good idea uh, because I get, I get complaints about modified yeah. exhaust all the time, and um, my traffic guys primarily work during the day, during yeah. the week, um, but it's something that myself and other area commands can look at doing. For, Madam Vice President, for what it's worth, I think as you're building those plans, I think if we pass this tonight and are sort of trying to address this from all angles, I'd love to see um, what traffic could do in, say, a week on a TAC plan to really target mm -hmm. those and educate officers about what the codes are, because we're just getting back to the place where officers have the time to do some of that proactive yes, work, sir. and not just your officers, but that. I think a two-pronged approach would be helpful, but I do support this and thank the sponsor for bringing it. Councillor Jones and then Councillor Benton. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also support this. I think what we need to look at as a city, yes, we do have some violent crime. Yes, we do have some major crime. But when we don't enforce the minor crimes or the ones that start out like fun street racing or fun shoplifting or fun hanging out at the corner doing drugs and harassing people, it grows into something more. And we cannot simply ignore the rest of the community and everything that's going on, especially with an activity like this that could potentially be so terribly dangerous to a lot of, I'm assuming, young people. I'm afraid there might be some older people who should know better who have been born when 50% of the people have never even <laughs> been alive. But um, because old people are stupid too. So, uh, but I do believe we have to look at every part of our city and not just the major crimes. So thank you officers for, and, and Mr. Melendres for coming up with this uh, legislation that we hope can work and obviously it's something that can be refined as we go along. If you see there are other things that can help you make it work better, so thank you. Councilor Benson. Thank you Madam Vice President. I, I do support this, but uh, I'm reminded of a debate on this council that some of us may remember eight years ago when uh, we had uh, a whole bunch of bikers here in the room and, and uh, we were talking about modified equipment, and exactly what, what uh, uh, Councilor Davis was just talking about. Modified equipment, specifically mufflers uh, that are incredibly loud. I mean, then there's cutouts, that we used to call them in, in the old, when I was a hot rider. Uh, where you just cut out the muffler entirely and the exhaust goes straight out and supposedly you can go faster that way. But, uh, or you can at least call attention to yourself much better. And a lot of this does seem to be about people calling attention to one another. Um, but not all of this is for spectators. A lot of this is one-on-one, -on -one, out on the street, at three in the morning, going through 
near residential neighborhoods and keeping pe people up all night long. Um, it's, it's beyond a quality of life issue. It's, a, it's an issue of rampant lawlessness. And that breeds something worse, right? I think that's what you were talking about, Councilor Jones. Uh, it breeds something worse. It's not just that there's, there's two dudes out there racing at, at, at two in the morning. It's that it's in rampant violation of, of you know, clear knowledge that, that it's uh, dangerous and it's uh, harming other people's quality of life. Um, and so I'll put my pitch in for attack plan. Um, understood that, that it's dangerous for us to, for you to pursue these people. And you're not, you've already said, we're not going to pursue somebody with a highly modified vehicle that can probably outrun your vehicle. Um, and even if you were able to uh, uh, get close to them, the whole dynamic of that pursuit is dangerous to everyone, everyone concern yourselves. Uh, uh, the uh, perpetrator, but then also others on the street. So we, all, we see this all the time. I'm wondering if there's something, uh, uh, Commander Rivera, for any of you, just, and I've pitched this to previous chiefs. I don't, can't remember whether I've pitched this chief guy or yet, but I've pitched it in the past, which is why don't we, or is it possible for us to build a record about the individuals using high quality photography? Uh, build a record about, you know, it, it would be sort of, it, there'd be some somewhat akin to the red light cameras where you're, you're documenting the vehicle, you're not necessarily uh, documenting the driver of that vehicle, but if, if a vehicle is repeatedly part of this activity, is there a way to, to do something along those lines where we could build a record about the perpetrators and, and catch them in a, in a when they're not racing, uh, that we know that, that they're part of this. Sure, Madam Vice President, Councilor Benton, our current CAD system, if you, if an officer calls out, let's say it's a normal traffic stop, you know, I don't know, speeding, just five over, the CAD system will tell that officer this vehicle has been involved in these other types of calls based mm -hmm. on the license plate. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of already there. It's not a photograph, but... Um, there is a database that says this vehicle has been involved in these types of incidents and it's the day the officer can click on it and it says it pulls up the previous incident that, that vehicle was involved mm -hmm. in. So it, it's there. Um, I don't know about a photographic database, so to speak. Maybe that's something that, uh, our uh, service aides could even take that on and, and just uh, stay out of the fray, just document <laughs> yes, what's going on. I mean, we... Uh, I and my wife live with this, uh, you know, just about every night. We live close to Central Avenue, and Central Avenue is a popular place. It's a popular place for cruising, but it's when it's uh, when it's less trafficked. It's also a very popular place for just one-on-one -on -one racing, and and uh, maybe not even racing, just people driving at extremely high speed without uh, without properly muffled vehicles. But uh, it's. It is a shame, uh, Councillor Winter mentioned the movies, Hollywood movies and so forth, and even you know, our own major automobile manufacturers sort of glorify this with some of their ads of cars racing through the downtown streets and looking real cool. Uh, but uh, it's a tough one, but, but as I say, I, I really, I, I will support this because I, we need to build up the toolkit, but I think we really need to continue to step out with some of these kind of ideas of, of how we can um, uh, we can catch folks without necessarily pursuing them uh, at high speed. Councilor, Thank you. Councillor Harris and then Councillor Winter. I'd uh, like to speak as well. Oh, okay. Councillor Pena, are you, uh, you're asking to speak as well? Thank you. Yes. So we're going to go with Councillor okay. Harris, Councillor Winter, and then Councillor Pena. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. And yeah, this is something that I've been interested in and somehow um, this actually fell through the cracks. I'm, all the uh, research that we're talking about here was actually in an email from my policy analyst to Chris Melendres in January. So this is something that is, um, you know, I support. Uh, we have a lot of drag racing on Eubank uh, in District 9 uh, east of, actually I guess it's south of um, Southern Boulevard. Uh, there's a, a tech park up there. And what will happen is because at night, uh, you don't have a lot of people driving to and from the tech park, and, but it's a big, wide, uh, essentially six-lane uh, drag strip. 
And uh, it's very dangerous for the people who work at the tech park at night or on base at night because they just driving to work at 2 in the morning. And then all of a sudden, here comes people screaming down the road uh, well over 100 miles an hour. And uh, the, the research has shown that uh, when you take away the thrill of, of, uh, um, of actually uh, having people uh, spectate and, and impressing these people who are coming out, and with the current uh, you know, social media, you can, on Instagram and Snapchat and whatever, you can very quickly get the word out that it's going to be on Eubank tonight, or it's going to be at the Balloon Fiesta Park tonight, or it's going to be wherever. And if we can have our, um, our uh, police officers uh, actually, they have tools to, to be monitoring that stuff and to get out there and, and start uh, citing people, it actually can make a difference. And it's extremely dangerous behavior. It's extremely lawless behavior. And uh, it's something that... Uh, we should do whatever we can. We should put another tool in our toolbox. We're not saying that we're going to have 300 cops arresting or citing 300 people, but if uh, we start making these spectators go to court and start having to pay fines, I mean, it will put a damper on it, and research has shown that it can. So, um, yeah, I support this legislation. I think it's, it's you know, probably a little bit past two. I'm glad that these other states and other cities have, have gotten to jump on us, and I think we should join them. Councilor Winter. Thank you, Madam Vice. Why don't we let Councillor Pena? Councillor Pena, would you like to speak? Um, yes, actually, uh, thank you, Councillor Winter. I just want to say that I really appreciate Councillor Winter and trying to do this. It just kind of really reminds me, uh, you know, the cruising ordinance that we had. Obviously, a very different, a very different type of uh, uh, youth activity that's out there, and you know, I just. I, I just really want to say that, you know, I, it really um, bothers me when we began to criminalize our, our youth and people who are, are, are being spectators, although I do agree um, with Councilor Winter, this is something that's occurring in my district at, at alarming rates, and, and, you know, it's, it's just terrible and, until somebody who is innocent um, gets killed. Um, it, are we going to bring lots of attention to this? But... Um, I really would like to ask Councillor Winter if he would consider, um, at minimum, adding to this some type of task force, because I know I did hear that the gentleman from the, the racing um, in, I, I forget his name, but I know that he, he's there, you know, and he met with us when we were actually doing the uh, cruising task force and really bringing the youth together and educating them and, and making them aware of of what's happening and really giving them an outlet and providing them an opportunity, maybe at a discounted rate, maybe it's something that the city could provide resources so that um, kids can go out there and, and race at the racetrack and then they can teach them how to, you know, the rules of the road and, and what they should and shouldn't be doing. I, I agree, I don't have the answer on how to, how to curtail it, but it's, um, I, I do get concerned when we begin to to um, criminalize youth, it's the same thing with the cruising ordinance when we had that. It was about lawlessness and them impeding traffic and they weren't allowing the emergency vehicles to pass and, you know, and when we sat down and really had that discussion um, with um, the cruisers and now be at the racers, it really, um, it really helped to, to bridge the gap between us old folks <laughs> And, and the youth. Councilor Winter. Yeah, thank you, Madam Vice President. And, and absolutely, I don't. this is not a cure-all for sure. And I think a lot more discussion. I think the discussion tonight has been very, very good and helpful and, and um, may help solve some of the issues. Um, I wonder if now we could go to public comment. Yes, do we, we ha do have can. some public comment absolutely. before? We have three people signed up to speak. Um, Robert Costa, Stephen Baca, and Tad Naminsky. Thank you, officers. Thank you. Hello, hey. thank you, uh, uh, Ma Madam Vice President and uh, Council. My name is Robert Costa. I'm the owner of Albuquerque Dragway. Uh, I've been operating out there for about 12 years. And uh, the racetrack uh, was originally put into place, you know, back when there was about half as many people on the earth, uh, you know, as, as we heard that comment earlier. Um, <laughs> Drag racing and street racing uh, has been a problem for many, many years, 
not just in Albuquerque, but everywhere. Uh, back all the way in the uh, early 1960s, Albuquerque Dragway was established uh, because of this problem, and it was primarily racing on South Eubank, uh, which they still do today. Uh, you know, uh, I did bring some schedules for those of you that would like to, to see what we do. Uh, we operate approximately 50 times a year, uh, always on the weekends. Uh, some are Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, depending on the season and depending on the week. Uh, we kind of alternate to, uh, to maximize our, our attendance and make sure that it doesn't cost us too much money to operate this facility. Uh, we do operate, uh, or I'm sorry, we do uh, give the opportunity for racers and spectators to come out in a safe environment where we have staff, uh, EMTs, fire uh, fire people, uh, you know, in a nice safe environment uh, between concrete walls and that type of thing. It's a pretty minor cost. It's about $25 for drivers and $10 for spectators on uh, most Friday and Saturday nights. Councillor Davis so, and then Councillor Benton. I just want to very yes. quickly commend you and say thank you. Uh, you stepped up to help us when we were dealing with this issue at Mesa del Sol. And part of the challenge is, like a lot of our neighborhoods are, that APD and the Sheriff's Department sort of push these folks back and forth. Um, and our community police officers reached out to you, and you offered an opportunity for some of those racers to be referred to the dry ray, dragway for a, a better and safer way uh, to do that. And I know a couple of them took you up on that, and it did help our issue there a little bit. And so I do appreciate you stepping up to be, help us try to convert some of these street racers to a safer environment. Uh, it did help, and we appreciate your partnership. And we, we're still willing to make that same offer. Uh, the the offer that he's that he's referring to is. Uh, we offered some free admission passes for drivers who, you know, who are out street racing. And basically it's just a pass that the, the officers can give to somebody that says, hey, you might not be street racing right now, but I have a good idea that you're going to be. Uh, so it gives them basically a one-time free, free admission to come in and see what we do. Councilor Benson. And uh, just since, since we're on TV and I'll remind us where... Uh, the dragway is. Uh, it's up in, Mace, up in Mesa del Sol, mm -hmm. uh, just past uh, Montessa Park. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to take uh, Broadway south to Bobby Foster and uh, kind of go the old way up to the pavilion. But so, so, yeah, organized racing is a lot of fun of all kinds. Yeah, know, absolutely. And, I've, I've been a, a drag racer myself for 25 yeah. years. Uh, my family has, has been involved in uh, not just drag racing, but in uh, hot rodding and motorsports you know, for, uh, for decades here. So thanks for providing, You're providing a safe alternative. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Mr. Stephen Baca. Oh, Councillor Winter, I'm sorry. Question. So tell me what, what you charge for someone that wants to come out there. What's exactly, and it's on the weekend, so what do you charge them? So it's $25 to operate their vehicle. Uh, most street-driven street, street -driven vehicles uh, will pass a technical inspection that we ask them to. Basically, they have to have safe tires, uh, no cracks in their windshield, seat belts, um, you know, just basic safety stuff. Uh, I can guarantee you that that you know every new vehicle on the road today will will pretty much pass a uh, a technical inspection out there, and it's ten dollars to watch on those same nights. And so they can they can race as many times as they want during that session. Uh, as as much as time permits, you know, uh, the more cars that we have, the less passes that uh, people get in. Uh, one of the things that we do is. Uh, if we have a very busy night, we'll stay open later and, you know, allow people to make, make passes until, you know, until they're kind of done for the night. Thank so. you, Madam Vice President. One more question. So do, yes. do you see much use of that from the, the street racers that race on the streets? Do you? Absolutely. We do see uh, approximately 100 to 200 uh, street-driven cars just about every week. Thank you. So, and uh, as one final uh, mention to the uh, commanders up there, we would be more than happy to to try to give them some advice and some recommendations. Uh, you know, as far as their tack plan goes, uh, you know, these are people that we know, and you know, uh, obviously we we would like to get them off the streets as well. Mr. Costa, so. just for the record, there's yes. also another speedway on. Um, on east, or I'm sorry, west. Yes, on the west side. That is Cynthia Motorsports Park. Yes, and uh, I know that they also offer uh, a road course, uh, you know, for street-driven vehicles. Uh, I believe they offer something called a time tack, 
where they can go out and for uh, a small amount of money, they can go through their road course as well. Thank you, sir. Madam Vice President, one, would you be willing to um, be a member of the task force if we got something together? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Mr. Stephen Baca. Mr. Baca. Hello, good evening, good, e good evening, city councilors. I am uh, Stephen Baca, and I am uh, completely against this idea. It's kind of unfathomable, unfathomable to me to just sit here and we're going to start ticketing individuals for just simply watching a race. What the council should be doing is should be it, they should uh, be looking at giving APD officers back some of their their power to do things. Uh, does anyone know how this would interfere with uh, the McClendon settlement if if we are giving APD officers the power to arrest someone? And McClendon is uh, an issue that the city council, per se, should uh, be looking at uh, trying to resettle or get rid of that uh, agreement. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Tad Naminsky. Did you sign up to speak? Thank, <coughs> thank you. My name is Tad Naminsky. <coughs> Here is uh, uh, so many problems uh, with this ordinance. Well, I'd like to ask uh, Brad Winter where he was when he was working for APS. He, he was disbel was disbelief last n night, whatever it was. It. So anyway, here is another, that's another nail to his coffin. Uh, that uh, has to do with everything about revenue and criminalizing people. City Council eager to pass it because that's a revenue. Well, here is another problem, APD. I just spoke, El Elvarado, transit at 1.30, they held this uh, idiot criminal on the uh, security. They were waiting for over a one hour, as far as I was because I have been there and come out and come back. So where is APD? Especially two o'clock in the morning? Are you kidding? How many cops gonna show up? Against 300 cars, spectators? Come on, wake up, you, you guys right here. You expect the spectators? 300 and other? Oh, that, that, that was only 300 cars, according to Brad, Brad Winter. How many spectators all together? I am just fed up with you guys. What are you guys doing? Think first and, uh, and work together. Wait till they have to get your act, their act together too on the weekend, especially. Not enough cops. Well, I, I spoke to Mr. G Dr. Ginger. He said, that's the way when cops don't do nothing, they never get in trouble. He said, oh, well, that's yes, very interesting, <laughs> and started laughing. <clears throat> Councilman, councilors. Um, I am here because of several factors and opposition as to two, two bills you were looking at tonight. This is one of them. Not only is this a violation of our liberties under the First Amendment, it's also true and positive neglect for any of the craftsmen who build these vehicles that are, are, man, are, are eligible to be on the road. We pay insurance for our cars, we pay for registration, we are in charge of our own destiny. Yes, there are some people that take it to the limit and others get hurt, but that's why these gentlemen have powers of authority to enforce the laws. Those same laws are not being enforced, that's why we have this issue. If APD were to go back to having the arresting powers in which they had before any of this drama happened in Albuquerque, we wouldn't have such a hard problem with this. And you're right, Mr. Mr. Isaac. This is civil disobedience at its finest. Refer to him as Council. I'm Bacon. sorry, ma'am. I, I, I apologize. Council Isaac. Sir, this is... Ben, I'm sorry, ma'am. I couldn't read it, right? So give me a break. I got two minutes up here. It could be Nazis with me. Please, sir. So Continue. what I have to say is you have a police force that can do their job. Let them do their job. Make policies. If you have to put a sticker on these cars that say, hey, these are for Speedway and track, guess what? You get taxed on it. Go ahead. Start hitting them with hurts in the pocketbook. 
Don't be taken away from the rights of us and the motorcyclists out there who have those pipes on their bikes as a form of safety. Yeah, I don't like it either. Big bike biker coming next to me, scare the heck out of me. I don't like it, it scares me. But you know what? It lets me know he's there. It lets me know I'm not killing that guy tonight when I make a left or right turn. Now, I'm serious, you need to start thinking about this because the city of Albuquerque is coming up against a major federal act and I'm gonna be part of it. It's called 42 U.S. 1983. I'm sure you all heard of it. This is not a, this is not a threat, this is a promise. There are other people like me from Northern you, New Mexico sir. who are part of this thank and you. we are concerned citizens for New Mexico's thank future. You, sir, I, your time thank you, for up. your time. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll go back to Councilor Winter to close. Or Councilor Sanchez, you have, I'm sorry, Councilor Winter. Uh, thank you, before we close, I just have a couple of comments. Uh, currently with the Albuquerque Police Department in specialized units, our gang unit has a total of four officers. With the crimes against children, I think we've got probably five or six officers. You know, here we are trying to possibly arrest spectators for you know watching car racers. I think the biggest problem is to stop the racing altogether, and that's been a challenge, and I'm very pleased to see the individual here from the racetrack and the drag strip to get people to go to these events and wanting to be involved in a task force. But I just think under the current number of police officers that we have, it's going to be extremely difficult to enforce arresting spectators for attending and watching a, a street race. I don't see how they're going to be able to do it and how we can get this done. But I do want to thank uh, Councilor Winter for introducing the bill. We know it's a problem. It's a serious problem. But we have not addressed the issue yet in stopping street racers, and now we're going after the spectators. I just can't support it uh, with spectators being in this legislation as an amendment. Um, before we go to Councilor Winter to close, Councilor Harris. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to talk about something that uh, people are saying, well, they're just standing around on the sidewalk. Um, you know, if, if somebody were to be, uh, let's say you had somebody in a bar fight, and somebody was just beating the crap out of somebody and you're standing there clapping, um, that, that's called assault. Um, you're, you're actually every bit as guilty as the person who's doing it. If you stand there and encourage someone to do a criminal act, you're guilty of that criminal act to the same extent as the person who's doing it. So it's not just merely standing around doing something innocent. You're encouraging someone to do something which is deathly dangerous. And I don't think it's, it's, it's not morally neutral behavior. It's, it's very um, morally repugnant behavior. And I think we should be uh, doing everything we can to make our streets safer. And uh, the other studies from other cities shown that this works. So uh, I don't think we have to, we're, n we're not the, the, the trailblazer like San Diego. There's lots of cities who have done it and it's shown that, that it has uh, caused a reduction in the street racing. So I think it's something we should try. Councilor Winter. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I think this whole discussion has been absolutely great. Um, this is not a cure-all for sure. In fact, will it make a dent? I'm not sure if it will, but at least it will give another tool that they can do. And, 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 and Counselor, um, you're absolutely right. You know, we don't have enough officers and it's not a priority call. But if you saw what I saw that night, it was amazing. And I could imagine, because I didn't know what I was turning up into, and it was, it was very interesting and um, a little intimidating. And I can imagine someone turning off that, that um, the frontage road off the interstate and going down there that it was racing. It was a problem. And um, I did talk to an officer after he came by and he cleared everybody out. And I talked to him and said, you know, and he said, you know, we've got to do something about it because not only are they just standing around, there's a lot of illegal activity that is happening while they're watching, the spectators are watching these races. And it's, it's, it's just part of it. And he said, we've got to do something. And he was walking around picking things up off the ground for evidence. And so you're right. I think we should have a task force too. And we'd be glad to put that somewhere in the bill too, because this won't absolutely won't deter it on. It might help and it did help in San Diego, but we've got to do some other things. Maybe when we get the helicopter, we can do some TAC plans with the helicopter and do some things. But you know, we're trying to get them out of bloom Fiesta Parkway, but what's going to happen is they're going to go to your districts. And if you saw what I saw, I think you would have a different opinion on spectators because they know exactly what they're doing. And these cars were going over 100 miles an hour down this short stretch. And um, 
one right after another, two right after another when I was going, because I was in the Q lane in my little Hyundai Elantra <laughs> going up the street really slow and all the spectators, and if you Bloom Fiesta Parkway, it's dirt roads on one side. And so they were parked two and three and four cars deep out of their cars watching these races and talking and doing things. So it, w it was a very interesting and it's totally different than anything I've, I've seen in the past as far as Montgomery, I can remember we did a lot of tech plans on Montgomery Street Racing and some on Passale, but this was different. And so it's a start. I can understand some concerns. And I'm not saying that police are going to go arrest anybody. They can cite them. But at least if they have the opportunity to tech plans, then maybe they can at least start saying this is illegal activity and, and we're not to condone it. So urge your support. Okay, well, I, I just want to say, Councillor, I probably am not going to support this because I feel like, um, you know, I, I, well, agree, I agree with you regarding, um, you know, the racing because I have it in my district as well. But I think the spectators, um, I mean, it creates an us versus them situation with our youth, and that concerns me greatly. And I, I would like to see, um, as mentioned before, a possible a task force with some youth to come up with some, with, the, with APD to come up with some ideas. But I just don't think we have enough police officers. So I'm not going to support it. But um, so I will call for the vote Madam now. Madam Vice President, since you, I should let you speak before I spoke because I get the last word on closing. Thank you. But let me tell you, it's interesting because it wasn't the 18, 19, and 20-year-olds that I saw this was more like 30 and 40 and older. And these cars, they put a lot of money in the cars, so it wasn't the young, young kids that were racing, it was adults. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilor Winters. So uh, with that, um, I will call for the vote. All in favor, say, signify by saying yes. 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 All those opposed? No. no. Councilor Pena? No. So that's a six to three vote. Thank you, Councilor. Um, let's see, it's after seven. Do you, what is the pleasure? The pleasure of the council is to take a dinner break. So we will be taking a dinner break. Thank you.